like we we said uh, big welcome to uh, we can start with with Felix from uh, joining from uh, Voyado in uh, in Stockholm big welcome and thanks for for joining in today uh, please share a brief background of, of you thank you so much uh, very glad to uh, to be invited so my name is uh, Felix I, like you already said I work as the uh, chief product officer at Voyado uh, and I've been here for about two years but I have a um, previous background uh, primarily within e-com. So I've been working with companies like um, Sporta Moore, Philippa K, Jill Lindeberg, and a couple of smaller ones uh, for the last uh, 12 years or so. So really glad to be here. Nice. Thank you very much for, for joining. And and uh, I know you have a lot of great stuff to, to share later. So so really look forward to, to that. Uh, and also big welcome to to Jessica from Houdini, who will be the, the guest speaker in, in, in the end. Uh, uh, thank you very much for for joining yeah. and and yeah tell us a bit more about about you and, and your background yes hello i'm jessica i'm from houdini sportswear and i work as a e-commerce tech lead there so uh, i work closely both with uh, voyado and keyword you and i'm uh, going to talk about about um how we use you and how we <laughs> find the synergies between our your system perfect nice thank you and uh, you want tell us a bit more about about you yeah, so yeah, my name is Johan and I work uh, at Keywordio and I do a lot of like Facebook and uh, TikTok uh, ads for our clients, but also yeah, hosting uh, some of these events. And if you saw some LinkedIn ads, you probably me created it. Yeah, definitely. And then, and then yeah, you, Jonas. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I work with with some of our uh, largest customers with uh, business development, and I'm also a co-owner of uh, Keywordio. So super happy to to be here and to be able to, to broadcast from sunny Copenhagen. It's, uh, yeah, so let's get going. Yeah. And I'm going to do one last thing before we start. Recording in progress. So yeah, also as we might know, like uh, this will be recorded. So you will get the recording of the webinar afterwards as well. Yeah, and everyone will also get access to the decks uh, uh, and everything that we, we talk about today. So so uh, yeah, uh, everything is, is in there. So we will uh, do the uh, a bit more of the intro and background, and then I will speak about the privacy in Google Analytics 4, what you need to think about for, for that. You one, you will get more into how to collect data and how to use that, for example, for, for TikTok and for, for Meta. Uh, Felix, you, you will get more into the depth of, of how to actually work with with Voyado and use the third party data and collect the data in a in a smart way and then like uh, you mentioned Jessica you will uh, share some of your learnings from how you are using both Voyado and, and Keywordio um, so that's the agenda for for today yeah let's, let's get started with the uh, private oh, actually who are we at Keywordio so uh, some people some of you might know who we are and some you might not know so we are a performance marketing agency and we focus on the paid search, so for example, uh, Google Ads, but we also do paid social, so like uh, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok ads, as an example. And we also offer like uh, creative content, so if you need help with editing your videos into great ads or uh, advertising, it's uh, us. But also a bit of marketing automation, like uh, CRM systems and implementation of that. And then a little bit of data implementation. Yeah, and what we're gonna talk more about today, measurement and, and privacy. Yeah, so, so that's Keywordio in, in a wrap. Yeah. And uh, what does uh, Voyado do, Felix? Yeah, so, so Voyado uh, is a Swedish company started in 2005 uh, where we uh, offer two products, basically. One within the multi-marketing space uh, and one within the uh, on-site personalization space. So we try to help customers bring together their data and uh, be able to use it to empower marketeers within uh, a bunch of different steps within the customer journey, basically. Perfect. And uh, then let's jump into the presentation. So heading over to Jonas. Yeah. Okay. Privacy. So so privacy. Both uh, you and I, Felix, will talk quite a bit about privacy today, right? And and I think one of the things that we talked about before this was that we really want to take away the the, the myth about this is about third party. Uh, cookies, for example, and third party data, because it's it's so much more. And, and, and I think for what we really see is that we have, for example, when we say privacy, we mean like GD GDPR is one thing. Uh, Schrems 2 is 
is uh, uh, one aspect of it. Key privacy is a third. Uh, the new technology that comes out from browsers and, and from uh, iOS updates and, and stuff like that, that's the fourth area. So it is very important to actually look at privacy as, as a whole. And, and it's not only the, the legal part, it's also technical. So you, no, you need to look at this aspect from, from a lot of different angles. And I know, for example, that Felix, you will talk more about, for example, what key privacy, what that, uh, for example, means in, in short. Uh, but I will bring you a couple of examples that I think is, is very interesting and, and also why this will be even more important in the future. So uh, this is a really fun, example of a company uh, that is called Generate. Uh, this company actually won one of the pitches for Dragon's Den uh, in, I think it was in the UK. Uh, so it's pretty much a, an ad blocker. Uh, but the interesting thing is they have turned their business model around. So you can actually enable this to, to sell your data as a, as, a, uh, as a user. So you can sell your data and then you get uh, credits that you can buy stuff online for. So I think this, this idea of actually trying to enable people to sell their own data and actually uh, monetize on, on that uh, is a really interesting take and innovation within uh, the business model. So I started an account and it looked like this after uh, a couple of days. So just by using their browser, uh, I was, uh, for example, collecting uh, credits that I can use later to, to buy stuff, uh, for example. And I think it's, uh, it's an interesting take on, on just trying to get more understanding for the average consumer and that they also understand that there is value behind your, your data. So, so I think these kind of initiatives will def definitely drive the general public uh, opinion about privacy and that will put more pressure and, and that will put more, uh, more uh, things that you need to think about as a marketeer to actually work with this uh, in the future. So generate, you can please look it up yourself and, and just test this. Uh, the second thing I mentioned was uh, uh, Shrams 2. And uh, of course, the person behind that and, and nobody's uh, uh, business uh, is uh, Max Shram. And what they have done, for example, is that they have sent in a lot of complaints for, for different uh, companies and sites in, in Europe, for example. And just to take a couple of examples from, from uh, uh, Scandinavia. So these sites have received their uh, complaints about how they have set it up. So just to be specific in terms of what the complaints has been, you, can, you will get a link afterwards. So you can actually go in and look at all the complaints that it sent in and read them in, in detail. But uh, the big thing here is that they have used uh, either Facebook Connect or they have used Universal Analytics. And then they have used an an Universal Analytics in a way where the data is sent to uh, US-based servers. So that is really the, 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 the reason why they have received these complaints. So for example, talking about, well, can we use GA4? It's always about how you actually set it up. So if you would do a full, for example, server-side tagging setup, have the servers in the US, and you will build that setup for, for Google Analytics 4, then that would not be uh, an issue, for example, uh, compared to, to these complaints, for example. So it's always about understanding what the complaint is about, how you technically implement it, and, and how to, to use it. The third area that we mentioned was that technology is changing fast. And I mean, for some of you who already started using the iOS 16, you have some even newer updates than what you see here in iOS 15.6. So when you go into Wi-Fi settings, for example, the first phone to the left, you can limit address tracking based on, on IP. In Safari browser, you also have a lot of like hide IP addresses, block all cookies, and those kind of tracking preventions. And most of them are put on, on default. So of course, this is something that always uh, uh, changes and you need to follow the latest trends on the new releases. And of course, uh, Apple is, is working a lot with, with this uh, space. And you also see similar things from, from other companies as well. So uh, the fourth thing is the general public. I mean, 
I visited LA earlier this year, and I think this just tells the story of that. I mean, these are the big billboards that you have uh, all over LA right now. So Apple is just pushing the message about privacy to the mainstream consumer, and this will change the, the requests that they have, and they will be more aware about privacy. You even see WhatsApp, they are pushing a lot about private and, and privacy. So when the big tech company starts to push privacy, I think that will affect the, the average uh, person, and that will put higher demand on, on how we as, as marketeers work with this in the future. So, so this is something you, you really need to work with long term uh, and continuously uh, look into. And of course, uh, that universal analytics will be sunset and not collecting any data. That's uh, for next year, 1st of July. So you need to have Google Analytics 4 set up if you're going to have year of year comparison. And, and of course, how you have set that up will be very important. So we typically uh, suggest that you have the framework of look how you collect the data. So for example, are you transparent with, with the consent uh, banner? What information you have there make sure that that is really something that you have looked into into details and continuously updating as you add on new technology or new marketing platforms and then the second thing is how you measure i mean how do you actually collect this and the third thing is i mean what how do you actually use this to activate your your uh, users and and uh, customers uh, which is the important part so everyone will, will get this slide afterwards and you can read more of the, of the details in it. And you also have this link. This is a blog where we try to collect most of the important links so you can really read the details. What is, for example, get the full list of the 101 complaints sent in from, from uh, Max Schrem, for example, and, and the Noibi uh, uh, Association, for example. So here. You have everything collected in one place and, and uh, go in and, and uh, read it through so you have everything in, in one place. So before you have implemented Google Analytics 4, we think it's very important that you actually make the readiness, like assess your readiness on privacy. What, what is it really? Where are you? How is it with the consent banner? How do you track it? How do you store the data? And really read through this and go through the details. So uh, either you have done all of that or you're just starting. Uh, but we have provided three packages of a self-service uh, solution where you pretty much have a, uh, a checklist that you can go through yourself. Uh, or you have a, a self-service plus a workshop with some of our specialists on this. Or that we actually take full responsibility of actually working with, for example, your legal team to make this assessment, see what needs to be implemented, and also uh, work with parts of the implementation as well. So, so this is our way to package uh, how to, to solve this uh, and assess where you are in terms of your privacy journey. So with Google Analytics 4, I mean, you can collect all the different data points. You can collect insight from your app, you get the insight from, from the web, and you can you can feed it in with other data sources as well. Uh, then you do the evaluation and, and analysis in, in the interface. And of course, the new uh, opportunity to export a lot of the data as well is, is something that you probably want to work a lot more with. But what we see is actually these four things is, is more important to start with. So like I said, start with, make sure that you do the privacy readiness assessment. Then establish what's the source of truth for your most important metrics. Typically for e-commerce, this is conversions and, and conversion value. And uh, the third thing is to make sure that you verify this data continuously. Because I meet a lot of companies that, hey, we, we cannot really trust Google Analytics or, or, or whatever. I mean, it's all about continuously working with, with verifying this so you know that the da data is, is healthy and you can, you can trust it. Then the fourth step would be to look into details about how to actually uh, do this uh, and how to configure the data stream, for example. So do these four steps and, and continuously work with verifying the truth. Don't set up Google Analytics 4 and try to match the data you have in Universal Analytics, for example, because the attribution model is completely different. Uh, you probably have some errors in the Universal Analytics setup that you don't want to try to replicate that. You want to replicate the truth and base it on, on that. So, so 
those are, are very important things and might sound basic, but we see a lot of companies missing out on, on this. So go in and, and look at some of the configurations. Uh, there is a new data model and there's also new attribution model as, as default. So make sure that you look into which one you want to have and also look at, uh, for example, the uh, look back window. So you adjust that based on, on, on your business needs. And also make sure that you have all the key connections set up so you feed that with as much data as, as possible. Uh, so uh, those are the, I would say the most important things to make sure that you have done right when you uh, implement Google Analytics 4. Yeah. So with that, hand it over to, to Johan. Thank you. So uh, then I will go like the collection of data on the different uh, platforms. So I will follow up with Jonas and start with, um, yeah, you want all the platforms synced in one place. Uh, and uh, as uh, Felix will talk about later, uh, it's ways you can uh, collect all your data and uh, in the first pa party data, for example. So if you want to have uh, stronger connections between different platforms, uh, there are certain uh, softwares, uh, like Periodo, for example, uh, on Toggle, that can help you with this. But uh, uh, Felix will dig in deeper into this uh, a little bit uh, later in the presentation. But this is a great way to connect the dots uh, when you're running advertising. Uh, so I will talk about the ideal sales funnel. Uh, so you want to take people from the see phase to the think, do, and then care. So in the beginning, if you want to attract new customers, they are stranger to your business. You need to run a lot of top of funnel brand awareness ads on platforms like uh, Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, for example, if you want to keep your cost down. Uh, and then when it coming, seeing your videos and uh, visiting your website and start interacting with your brand, uh, then you can connect other uh, platforms as well, uh, such as Google and uh, yeah, even like uh, Voyager. So if you run as a top funnel ad uh, and you want to like increase your newsletter uh, like members, uh, Voyager is a great way to do it because then you can collect the data and you can strengthen up to the connections uh, and just kind of tailor it back into the lookalike audience based on that. So it's a great tool. And then, of course, when people are starting adding to cart, uh, you want to, and they don't buy it, you can do like the retargeting ads. So, uh, sorry, it was a beep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yeah, you run the retargeting ads based on the behavior of what people do. Uh, and the different uh, connections uh, that we have. So, Google updating the privacy and like the tag managers, etc is uh, quite important uh, because they all kind of play uh, in hand. So uh, for example, server side tagging on Google is uh, quite important if you want to have successful ads because uh, Facebook using it as a, like a help to their uh, pixel. So for example, if you install the server side tagging on for example, Google server, uh, that will help you uh, quite significantly uh, when you running the ads because it's collecting the data that you would like to collect and you can kind of choose uh, what data that you want to send to uh, Facebook and uh, uh, TikTok, uh, et cetera, instead of that they're just taking all the data and people like opting out for it. So it's a lot more secure uh, for your privacy. So if you haven't uh, already implemented server side tagging, I, I highly recommend that you do it instead of the client side that you have probably in the past. And uh, when it comes to Meta, uh, the collection of data is slightly different. So uh, Meta, of course, they collect your name, email, and uh, the phone, because that's a requirement uh, for signing up for the platform. But they also collect a lot of event data. So what type of website you visit, what product you purchase, uh, if you install any apps, what kind of interests you have. But this also, you can opt out from the event data. So for example, if I buy a Houdini hoodie and I don't want to see ads, uh, I can opt out for it but there's ways you can help strengthen that connection. And with a uh, server-side tagging, and for example, uh, Facebook's new uh, conversion API, the connections will be a lot stronger. So before you have the pixel, which is one connection, but now we also have the conversion API, which is two. And then if you have Voyado as a third, then you have like three arrows or three chances to uh, hit the shot. 
Uh, so like if you play golf, you get three mulligans instead of one, which is yeah, a little bit better <laughs> if you're not as good. Uh, so it uh, gives uh, more data to the advertising platform and you can get more correct data in your report. So uh, I highly recommend that you uh, implement the conversion API. And there are a few ways to do it. So you can either use a conversion API gateway, uh, which basically you connect your Facebook pixel uh, to a cloud-based uh, server. So for example, uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, or you can use a direct integration, so you can connect your Facebook pixel to another cloud-based uh, server that's deeming less uh, shared data with uh, Facebook. Or the last one is a partner solution. So for example, if you have Shopify, they have a direct integration to uh, Facebook, which is yeah, it takes seconds to set up. So what is the cost and setup for this? So the first one, as I mentioned, the conversion API gateway, it's actually free to set up and it's usually quite fast. If you have server-side tagging or Amazon Web Services, for an example. So it takes like, yeah, about one to four hours to uh, set it up. And uh, most marketeers can do it or the IT department. Uh, but when it comes to the direct integration, which is most common uh, if you don't have a, like a partner, uh, like a website builder like uh, Shopify for example, then it will be a little bit more complicated because uh, you need to have like an external developer that needs to set it up for you. This can take quite a bit of time, like two to four weeks depending on how good they are. And uh, you need to like see the developer uh, if you want to uh, get this uh, done uh, easily. And it requires manual updates as well. So if you do any updates on your website, they need to constantly update uh, this thing. And the partner integration, as I mentioned, are like Shopify, for example. If you know where to do it, you can do it in like a minute. So it's yeah, very easy, but then it comes with a, another cost as well. Uh, and then it comes to TikTok. So TikTok, they store uh, quite a lot of data as well. So they store your age, your gender, what interest you have, where you live, what language you speak, what carrier you have. So in Sweden, it can be TRI or Telia or uh, Telenor, for example. Uh, what network you're on, if you're on Wi-Fi, 5G, 4G, 2G even, if you use it. <laughs> uh, what device you have, if you have an iPhone or Android or I Samsung or yeah, any like uh, devices you have. You can also target the different uh, price of the device. So for example, I know like a Samsung flip phone, they're like <coughs> almost 2,000 euros, which is yeah, quite expensive compared to, uh, I guess, uh, iPhone mini. Uh, so yeah, you can target depending on uh, what price of the device you have, and also the behavior. So the behavior is a bit different from interest. So interest is w who you follow, what uh, videos you like, uh, like press like, etc. But behavior is actually what you do on the platform. So for example, if you only follow like chefs, for example, on TikTok, uh, but you're only watching uh, golf videos, but you don't like any golf videos, but you just keep watching them, then your behavior uh, says that you're interested in golf, but you're interested uh, that you are in, uh, in a chef. So there are also a slight difference between these. So the behavior one only tracks for seven uh, or 15 days, depend on uh, the interest. And the interest one is uh, remote. So it stays on the platform for 60 days. So it's more long-term behavior uh, that's interest-based. And the behavior is more short-term. Uh, so it's uh, a little bit different. And of course, the behavior is only organic content, while the interest is both organic and paid. Mm. So if I see a lot of ads that are highlighted in, for example, golf, that can be uh, one of the reasons. And of course, the interest is predicted by machine learning, while the other one is ground truth about uh, user behavior. So we actually did a quite funny exercise uh, with TikTok on this. So uh, we just said, open the TikTok app. Well, first we said, what do you think your interests are on TikTok? And then we thought, yeah, I'm only watching like golf and uh, uh, skiing videos, for example. And then it's like, okay, open the app, see if it's true. And if it shows something different, yeah, that's kind of what uh, you, your behavior is. So yeah, it can be a funny exercise in your team to see uh, yeah, what people actually are interested in. <laughs> um, and then comes to the tracking on uh, TikTok. So there are three, three different pixels that you can use. So it's a standard mode pixel, it's a pixel developer mode, 
and also a third one which is advanced matching and events API. So if you're new to TikTok and as a new company, the, the beginner one is quite easy to set up. You just install the code on your website. The bad thing is only tracks data for a day. So if I went to Houdini's website today and I bought like the power hoodie tomorrow, it wouldn't show that the conversion came from TikTok. But if I went to the intermediate one, I need to set it up a little bit more advanced, but then it can track uh, for seven days, for example. An advanced one is recommended for larger e-commerce because it uh, allows really good retargeting uh, features. So yeah, the attribution window, the default is one day, the developer mode uh, and advanced matching is one day view or seven day click. And uh, the developer mode and advanced matching, the last one is uh, same as once, one day view and seven day click. But it also uh, allows retargeting on the site, which is really powerful. And now they even uh, implement like uh, the views on the videos you post. And I mean, this is something we see quite often that people miss when they do the basic setup first and just start starting accounts out. So yeah, it's exactly. pretty common that this is not set up properly. No, yeah. and it uh, takes a bit of a trial and error to get it right. But uh, if you need any help with it, just let us know and we can guide you in the right way. And uh, that's it for me. So I'm handing over to uh, Felix. Thank you. I am going to try to steal the screen sharing for a second. There we go. You should see the correct screen now, I think. Give yeah. me a thumbs up. Perfect. And a smooth nice. transition as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I will be talking about why first party data is becoming more and more important for you guys. Uh, and especially now that cookies are um, becoming sort of less efficient. Um, and we really need to start off where, where sort of Jonas was as well. We, we're at the point where we need to stop worrying about third party cookies. It's, it's, it's the, the, the train has already left the station. Safari hasn't had it in, in a bunch of years. So there's, there's different mechanisms that we need to look at. I'm going to run through these quite quickly, but we're going to stop at, at e-privacy for a second and, and look at the changes that's going on there. So if we start with GDPR, we already know about it. We handle it as an industry quite well. Um, the, the Scrams 2 um, uh, debate is still ongoing. There is a discussion about the new sort of deal between the US and EU that might solve uh, this, but we don't know much more yet. I will be digging deeper into e-privacy in a while. And then again, like Jonas said, you know, we have the, the sort of browsers and operating systems, right? And, and primarily we have um, Apple and, and Safari really pushing the boundaries here. Uh, Google still haven't figured out how to get rid of third party cookies, but when we look at data, at least in, in the sort of Western countries, Apple already have such a large market share. So, uh, so this is sort of our new normal here. And then, I mean, if we just look linearly at what's going on in the market, we can just assume that more legislation, more regulation from both tech and a legal standpoint will come. So, so it's, a, it's a really important area to sort of be on top of uh, in your companies. If we look at e-privacy, I mean, this is the, the thing that actually regulates cookies, right? Uh, and it states a bunch of different stuff, like you need uh, explicit consent, you need to inform in a good way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The sort of issue with the e-privacy directive is that th there are no big fines. Uh, no one is actually uh, getting enough fines to, to, to comply to this. Uh, and that's one of the really big changes that are coming. So e-privacy directive will be updated into a regulation. Uh, this isn't sort of set within, um, within the EU yet, so we can only assume what will happen when reading through the, the sort of texts that are coming out. But we can assume that non-compliance will basically give the same fines as GDPR. And that's a really big thing, because if we rely too much on cookies, and we get GDPR-based fines, we can assume that we need to change the way we work with it. 
It's also going to address other things like fingerprinting, so these sort of grayish ways of, of uh, gathering data. And then the third thing is that it will most likely address dark patterns and journeys within cookie consents. And the top one and the last one will most likely make cookies very much uh, less efficient. And for those uh, who, who are not familiar with dark patterns, it's basically this, right? You overload with information. It's difficult to, uh, to say no. It's, it's sort of hindering. The agree button is green while the manage partner button is white and we're lacking an entire I don't want uh, to have cookies, right? So cookies will stay. Uh, they will most likely just become uh, less efficient. So when we try to look at what this actually means from, from a sort of market changing perspective, um, we can see that data will become less accessible. Uh, I think we are all aware of what happened when, when sort of um, Apple released the app tracking transparency and you couldn't be tracked in apps. Um, the latest data that we've found is that approximately 15 to 25 percent now accept to be tracked. Uh, it started out with like 5%. Uh, but here we can just assume that 75% uh, of, of, of apps won't be able to be tracked. And we should assume that a similar thing will happen when we look at cookies, right? The second one that Jonas also, also talked about is awareness of data privacy. And uh, KPMG did a, a huge study in 2021 that showed that almost 90% of customers have growing concerns about data privacy. And that will also fuel the behavior of not accepting to be tracked in different ways. Thirdly, we have these big tech regulations. So a lot of the um, legislation and regulation is, is targeted uh, at these huge tech comp corporations. Uh, but we can see that we're, we're all getting impacted by it. So for example, there's a, a court ruling that says you can't run Google fonts in Europe because Google fonts sends the IP address to, to the US. So it's not only about sort of advertising. It's, it's, it's a more general problem where we will see impact. And thirdly, like we've talked about a lot, you know, browsers and operating systems will keep uh, increasing privacy uh, that will shift it from a technological standpoint. When we try to sort of look at these then from, from a challenge perspective, what is it with these changes that we need to, to, to dig deeper into? We can sort of take these and say, okay, we're gonna have a completely new privacy landscape. It's, it's unescapable. And there are three sort of main challenges within this space. So the first thing is you're going to need more explicit consents. You already need them, but it's going to be more important that you gather them. The second thing is we're already seeing, and you're going to see a lot more of it, the, these unintentional effects on your customer experience work or your customer understanding work. And thirdly, again, cookies will become less efficient. So moving towards other types of solutions uh, will be needed in the future. So if we look at explicit consents first, you're gonna need them for quite a lot of things. Uh, so firstly, when we look at sort of profiling or personalization, that today already needs an explicit consent. Uh, and because we don't uh, get enough fines for, uh, for our cookie consent banners, et cetera, a lot of companies hide these within the, within the cookie consents that just won't work in the future. Again, for cookies, it's going to become much, um, it's going to be a much bigger focus on the explicit consent. And similarly, like we've been talking here, how do you utilize first party data with ad platform sharing? Uh, you need explicit consent for that as well. So this is something to really keep in mind in how do we gather explicit consent? Secondly, are these unintentional effects? So. Uh, I think a lot of people here know about this already, but as soon as Apple started uh, bringing down the barriers for third party cookies, uh, these technology uh, tech companies started placing first party cookies, right? 
and Apple even went out when this happened and said, there's, there's things that, that's going to be affected that we don't want to be affected, but we have no choice. And these things, for example, is web analytics and attribution or A-B testing, because the window in which you can identify a customer becomes much, much smaller. And I think we're all already affected by this, uh, and we need to figure out how to sort of circumvent these things. When we look at cookie efficiency, this is a really ugly slide, but uh, it's the best one I found, which is from advanced metrics. So they did a study on uh, how many people in a market actually accept cookie banners or just close it. Uh, so they don't look at no's, just accept and close. And what we can see is it, it differs a lot in the market. So us based in Sweden, having a lot of Swedish customers, we can, we can see that you know, Sweden and the Netherlands uh, have a, quite a high acceptance rate, while some markets have a really low acceptance rate. And we, we, we should assume that the acceptance rate will go down. Um, so we, we need to consider how to get um, first party data in that's not cookie based, right? So the effects of all of these challenges, uh, and I think again, we're already feeling these, is that you know it becomes harder to understand customers. That's a sort of uh, the broad thing. So understanding behavior, attribution, testing, communications, retargeting, all of these things uh, really boils down to it's harder to understand customer behavior. And what happens? Well, we can already see that in a lot of ad platforms, for example, that the, the CPA and CPC levels are going up because they have a harder time figuring out who the customer is. There's also sort of this when personalization becomes harder, we can see sort of conversion decreases on the e-commerce platforms. And ultimately, that this really leads to sort of customer lifetime value decreasing and increased sort of operating expenses in general that needs to, to, to be addressed. And lastly, then, you know, we really need to think, rethink business fundamentals, privacy and, and uh, tackling these challenges will become really uh, important. There, there will be a winner loser relationship between those who sort of adapt and those who don't. So what's the solution then? Uh, the silver bullet? Uh, well, we like to think of it as a sort of customer first data strategy or a first party data strategy. Um, and I, for those of you who don't follow uh, Tom Fishburne or Market Tunist, I love him. He does these amazing cartoons revolving around marketing. Uh, and this is one of my absolute favorite ones, trying to explain the different flavors uh, of data. Uh, if we look at it, you know, we have zero party data, stuff that uh, a person gives freely. They want something from us. First party data, you know, obviously something that we can collect again consensually, but we collect it. We don't, uh, or we're not handed it uh, from the customer. And then we have second and third party data. And the, the first party data strategy or, or uh, customer first data strategy really revolves around how can we get these two in a good manner? How can we take ownership of the customer data ourselves so we can utilize it to give a better experience? And there are some like three main pillars when it comes to building a, a sort of customer first strategy or a first party data strategy. And the first one is, 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 is sort of having somewhere to, to, to bring all this data together. It's normally referred to as a CDP um, and, and they differ quite a lot depending on the use cases, but you want some like a single source of truth for as much of your data as possible. And that's really because you will have a lot of data inputs and a lot of data outputs. Uh, and if you have multiple sources, it's gonna, you, you're going to have a harder time actually bringing this to life. Secondly, what we're seeing in the market is, is sort of a consolidation of the, of the tech stack. And it comes back to this single source of truth that if you have a lot of different systems uh, interacting uh, and utilizing data in different ways, uh, something's going to go wrong at some point. Either it's difficult to get the data out or it's difficult to get the, the delta of the data back in. 
So we're seeing quite a large sort of market cons uh, some MarTech consolidation. Uh, and that's also something to sort of keep in mind. And secondly, I mean, data governance. Um, how do you manage these different consents from GDPR to cookies, etc.? cetera? Um, you need to have some sort of, uh, of uh, system or process in place to, to manage because it, the consents will increase uh, as we move forward. And then, I mean, uh, I obviously represent a company that works with first party data. So why should you believe me? Uh, well, we, Deloitte did a, a, a huge sort of marketing trends study uh, last year where they really sort of focused down on first party data. And I, I have the reference link here if you, if you want to download it. But um, they saw a, 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 a growth increase in the companies that had a first party data strategy. Uh, and it, it, it comes down to first party data really helps you bridge these challenges. Uh, and obviously then the, the companies who didn't have grew uh, less or even had negative growth. So some, some things to, to sort of take with you. Um, when we look at points of sale, when, when working with first party data, identification is crucial. Uh, so we need to have some sort of way of identifying customers. And for, for an e-commerce perspective, there's been this widespread idea that uh, accounts are might be true in the sort of very, very small micro conversion step, but in the long term, you will want this data. So, so having a way to, to, to log into the site uh, will be a sort of really important step moving forward. You can also do other things like Jonas and Johan talked about, you know, moving to server side implementations of cookies or utilizing solutions that identify the customer for the site, but, but really consider if, if you should have uh, a login. If you have stores, I mean, having a, a, an experience in a store where, where the sales rep asks, uh, are you a member? And you say no, and the store rep says, okay, that's, that's just not gonna cut it in the future. Really digging deep into identifying um, customers in stores will be super important. And then of course the question becomes, you know, okay, how, how should we identify all of these people? And here is where loyalty and sort of loyalty practices really come into play. There are no illoyal customers, period. There's just more companies competing for their attention and sort of why shouldn't I as a customer take the best offer that I'm off, uh, given? There's nothing really immoral in that. So we need to sort of bring it back and, and consider what can we bring to our customers uh, for them to give us their data? And that could be a bunch of different things. And, and, and the normal stuff is sort of rewards or gamification or achievements, but it could also just be experience. So like I said, when, when app tracking started, it was 5% consent and it's 25% now. Uh, my subjective idea is that people want relevant ads they want relative fee, uh, or relevant feeds. They want personalization and they want stuff that's relevant for them. Um, so think of this also as bringing a great experience in all channels that you have. And this is really where sort of the link between first party data and advertising comes in. So I want to sort of end up with a couple of things, three things that you should do straight away. First one, look over reviews, uh, review your uh, cookie and consent processes. Just are these in place? Do you have everything you need? Are you doing it in a compliant matter? Secondly, there's an interesting thing with profiling. Um, if you provide a service back to your customers, like these normal sort of membership uh, customer clubs are, you can actually place it in the service and say, we need to profile you to bring you this service. So it's I don't want to say loophole, but it's a, it's a way of bridging the profiling gap. And secondly, I mean, make loyalty a sort of key question in your organization and customer offering. What are you bringing back to the customers? And that will help you also with ad creatives and a bunch of, of different things that's difficult. And lastly, three things to sort of consider more long-term. 
The first one is, is again, do you have a good proposition? Why should customers choose you? And, and who is responsible for sort of answering that question within your organization? Secondly, who is responsible for understanding and being proactive within the privacy landscape? It's much easier if you have someone who, who, who reads, uh, for example, Keywordio's blog or whichever outlet you, you like uh, and can inform the rest of the companies to take action. And thirdly, I mean, which KPIs are important? Traffic and conversion, obviously, if you're an e-commerce company, but are you also tracking these more loyalty-based uh, metrics like NPS or how long did it time for them to take their second order? How can you progress them from a loyalty standpoint? That was all from me. Thank you. Thank you. And then I think we have the last one with uh, Jessica. Let's see. I will share the screen again. Yes. Hello, everyone. So for you who uh, didn't join us earlier, I'm uh, Jessica and I'm the e-commerce tech lead at Houdini Sportswear. And uh, we are using both Voyado and Keywordio. So I'm just happy to share with you how we are using both of these companies to gain more um, personali personalized ads and uh, uh, the synergies between them. Yes, so we are using one uh, service at uh, Voyado that's called Online Ads, which makes us uh, using our already customer-based data and uh, encrypted it, uh, send it over to uh, Meta and Google to create lookalike audiences and using our first-party data to gain more relevance and do personalized ads to find people that are looking like our already uh, signed up audience. Yes. So like Felix talked about, we know the importance of the, the first party data. And uh, this last year, when we are having both Voyado and Keywordio, we have uh, increased our newsletter subscribers with 30%. So we are super happy with these, uh, these two companies helping us moving forward in this cookie world. Do you have an example, Jessica, of, of how you utilize it? Like, how do you segment your customers? Is it based on preference or is it based on our best uh, customers? For yeah, example? we're having different segments in Voyada. We are both using, uh, you have something called RFM, uh, which is a recency, frequency, and monetary system where we can like grade our audience and see where our customers are how often they buy, for how much, and uh, for how recent they buy something. And then we can take like our top uh, customers and create a, a segment for that, and then send that segment to Keywordio that will help us with both Facebook and uh, Instagram and Google, um, and set up like look like audiences and find uh, more people that will match us and will be interested in Houdini and our, our company and brand. And I think it's a good example, like um, I know you have uh, sometimes a year you have a, a little sale and uh, you offer like a little pre-sale for uh, the, the loyal uh, customers and exactly. uh, like maybe someone doesn't open their email like every day, but then it's a good way we can remind them on uh, Facebook that uh, it's a members only sale uh, during this time or a special offer. Uh, yeah. That, uh, yeah helps a lot with the uh, Voyado and uh, when they sign up. Exactly. It's uh, it's important to like have these different touch points and not only rely on the newsletters, but also see that we can connect to them through both Google and Meta yeah. uh, and uh, find different ways to attach them to us. So yeah, I think it yeah, takes that's one about, way how we work with it. Yeah, I think it takes about four touch points a week until you actually uh, get your head into it, uh, basically. Like mm. even though if you're like, yeah, I really want that, but then uh, something else happened, like the dog maybe comes in and you totally forget. And then when you're sitting on the bus, like, oh yeah. And then you need to jump off and then maybe the third or fourth time you're like, okay, yeah, now it's time. Yeah. <laughs> and Crazy. here is really also, because you guys have stores, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so here is really where, where the sort of identification in store thing comes in. Uh, let's say that you know uh, a customer has purchased something in store. You might not want to run Google Ads towards that customer to optimize your Google budget, mm. yeah. or you know you've sent uh, you, you've seen an, an ad. They go to a store, they purchase something, and then the, it can be looped back. So 
uh, for a lot of companies, you know, in the e-commerce space, you might get a lot of the data, but as soon as you have stores, it's quite difficult for mm -hmm. uh, to match all of this. So um, it's, it's, it's a good way of working when you have stores as well. Yeah. And it's also a good way to look at customers who uh, haven't interacted with, with us for a while and like have different touch points to make them become active again and see how we how we can gain their interest again because you know there's a lot of buzz going on so we have to be relevant a long time yeah yeah okay. well uh, yeah i don't know do you have anything you want to uh, <laughs> ask me about yeah i think we have uh, uh, i think just adding on my reflection onto this i think it all needs to start with really good business understanding from from like uh, like uh, Houdini. I mean the team your yourself, and then of course enable what we can actually do with ba do with that based on technology. And I think that's that's why this partnership is so important. Like it, we need to have all the parts to be able to do all of this. Uh, uh, and then speaking about stores, for all of you who are in Stockholm, you have an amazing new flagship store opening up soon that uh, that I think, uh, yeah, maybe we can give a little teaser about that, uh, Jessica, <laughs> as well, because for everyone in Stockholm, there's going to be some uh, yeah, amazing new flagship store coming up, right? Exactly. On Kungsgatan in the end of o October, we are uh, we're having a little party. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, great location. I walk by it every day to, to the office, so yeah, very nice. Yeah, yeah. me, me and Johan is trying to talk with the construction team every day to get them to speed up, so <laughs> we're really excited about this one. Yeah. Uh, we as well. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but uh, yeah, like uh, as we said before, if you have any questions, I see we're kind of running out of time like today, but uh, if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to uh, reach out and uh, we will you send you the slides afterwards and also uh, a recording. Uh, and you have our emails there if you want to ask like a personal question to us regarding what we talked about today.